Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Doing, the platform where we explore the latest and greatest in the world of Malaysian content innovation. I'm your host Abid and today we are diving into the pulsating heart of the digital creative content industry. Our guest today is Mr. Mohan Lo, the Director of Digital Creative Content at Malaysian Digital Economy Corporation, MDEC. With over two decades of experience, Mohan Lo is at the forefront of shaping Malaysia's digital landscape, focusing on gamification, animation, and virtual experiences. He has been instrumental in mentoring young talents, driving gaming culture, and positioning Malaysia as a hub for digital content. From launching numerous interactive media projects to mentoring gaming startups, Mohan Lo's journey is a testament to his passion and commitment to the industry. Today, we will gain insights into his mind-blowing experiences with the younger generation in digital creativity, tackle the brain drain issue, and discuss the future of virtual experiences and AI in the creative sector. Without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Mohan Lo on what's doing. Thank you so much, Mohan, for coming onto the show. And uh, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a it's a pleasure. Yeah, Mohan, uh, can you share the vision uh, for Malaysia's digital creative content industry under your leadership at MDEC? I think uh, you know Malaysia has been supporting, or the government of Malaysia has been supporting this industry for about fifteen years already. I think it started out with animation, and so um, I think for me the vision right now is really is about building and. You know, catapulting what you know the the giants in the past have has built upon, right? But moving forward, I I think uh, digital content, primarily you know the games industry and the animation industry, uh, these are the areas that we look at, has been has been growing quite rapidly, I think in in Malaysia. So for us right now, I think it's about taking a, a leadership position, right? In regionally at least. I think we've reached a point where um, we've got a lot of content coming out, but I think we're missing that you know big hit content, uh, whether it's animation or games. Animation's probably done with better. Uh, it's traveled around the region. Uh, in fact, even you know as far as as, as Japan actually, <laughs> um, through the the Makamato series. Yeah. But for for games as a whole, or animation as a whole. I think we have an opportunity uh, to take a leadership position, right? Uh, at least in the region, uh, when it comes to digital content. So I, I could probably talk a lot more about that, uh, but I don't know if you want me to elaborate further. Please, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I think for for if you look at the games industry, for instance, we've, it's it's kind of broken up into multiple types of content, and for me, uh, I would say there's indie content, and then there's there's uh, you know larger scale projects. Uh, and the term we use is like AAA titles. Uh, again, I'm I'm very oversimplifying here, but I see that we have an opportunity to be producing a AAA title or at least co-producing a AAA title from Malaysia in the next uh, you know two to three years. So that's our aspiration for smaller indie companies. Uh, when I when I first joined MDAC, I think seven years ago, there was a handful of indies that were recognizable. And I think you know we went through a couple of programs in the past, um, and what at that time my goal was uh, you know to get at least three studios that would be able to generate at least a million dollars in revenue or a million dollars in terms of uh, funding, because we're not competing with just local production, right? We are looking, we want to compete on a global scale, so that would be like the bare minimum. So we've already hit those targets, and so it's a moving moving post at the moment. I, I think right now uh, that vision is to to grow and to scale and you know to to get to uh, comp- uh, you know products like Supercell and 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 you know Clash of Clans and so forth. That would be you know the the vision that we have. I think having a small a smaller studio that's capable of having a, a big reach. As for the animation side of things, I think uh, uh, this is not so much a vision, but I think it's. It's an adjustment to the industry. I feel. I think there's uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, history already in the animation industry, and I think there's a lot of disruption coming. And and that with that disruption comes opportunities. 
And so we are hoping at least to be able to capture some of those opportunities, uh, whether it's in terms of technology, in terms of business models. Uh, those are the things that we, or at least for me, uh, that's what drives uh, us. Again, from a future perspective, <laughs> I'm broadening this a, a bit more. Um, these are foundational technologies, right? Uh, or rather foundational pieces, right? To a greater picture at the end of the day. Uh, and you know, I, I don't really like to use the word metaverse right now. It's been overused. But I think probably the right word is immersive experiences. Video game and animation and content, right? Uh, are building blocks. And we have the talent, right? To move that. And so we are looking at something called the Monkin Project, uh, which is called the IP, currently codenamed IP360. Uh, I'll probably elaborate more on that actually uh, later. And so a lot of it is right now, you know, we've got strong momentum in the animation games industry, and we want to leverage that and we want to build something greater uh, with this IP360 project. Yeah. Great. Uh the thing is, in the space you're working with, you're working with the Gen Zs and, and, and millennials mm. you know, uh, in the industry. And uh, how is it working? I mean, how, how, do, how do you work with them? I, again, I, I, I think that the Gen Z, or they are, they are a very independent group, I think. Uh, um, so approaching them has been, you know, we have to understand you know what what are their needs they're inclusive they they very they want to be very very inclusive they want to be independent and we we are providing for all of this right uh, in terms of uh, uh, the opportunities in, in in learning and and so forth so I think most studios uh, they're also a very passionate crowd right they they live in a in an environment where you know their content is around them all the time. Yep. Right. And and so this this uh, I guess uh, stew of information, right? Too much. Yeah. Too much. Too much. But does it uh, means uh, it gives more opportunities or with the or, or do they have more challenges working with them? I I, I think as in any generation. They are exceptionals. They are exceptionals, and they are, uh, I would say, people that are unclear about what they want to do. I guess, <laughs> right? It's different motivation. I think the only difference here is that uh, it's more polarized. I see, you know, the newer generations when they are hungry and they are good, they are empowered, right, by all the different. Uh, resources that are available to them today, as opposed to people from our generation, you know, like when I first started, I wanted to build a game, for instance, back in the day, like how do I find funding where there was no internet, there was no, and so you have to build everything from scratch and, and, and you know, how do you negotiate a contract? None of this was available, right? And so if you have the desire today, I think uh, the information that's available to you really, really enhances uh, whatever you have. Um, so I, 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 I don't want to say that it's, it's, it's harder. I think every generation is just different. Again, uh, like our generation, for me, I'm a Gen Xer, I guess. And independence is, is huge, right? Uh, ability to be... I think the, the new generations, they know what they want fairly early if they're good. Uh, the rest of them, I would say, uh, takes a lot of guiding, I guess. On that note, uh there's a lot of brain drain happening. Mm. Okay. And so how uh, MDEC is implementing, you know, uh, checks and balances in that area uh, where the digital creative industry is concerned? Actually, I I would beg to defer that it's a, that's a brain drain happening. Um, I'll, I'll elaborate again here. I, I think it's, it's reversed. Actually, we are actually having a lot more Malaysians, right, uh, returning to Malaysia, actually. Um, the main reason is, is opportunities. So if you look at um, the number of animation studios or number of game studios, for instance, right, we have pretty much at least regionally award-winning or even if globally award-winning studios already. Right? Um, again, I'll reference uh, Monster as one of the studios that has won in Japan, right? uh, a pretty prestigious Japanese award there. And as for games, in the games industry, uh, I have so many returning Malaysians. 
Again, because you've got studios like PlayStation that set up here, you have EA here right now, you have Larian Studios that just won Game of the Year with, with Baldur's Gate uh, set up here. So every time a studio wants to set up, you need someone senior to lead these teams. And every Malaysian that I've met or most Malaysians overseas, right? So if you look at the, stu the heads of all of these studios, right? Uh, most of them are a Malaysian or a returning Malaysian, actually, at this point in time. What are we doing really is uh, providing opportunity, actually. So we want to be able to build the right environment through, you know, providing and providing the right opportunities. And you can do that through foreign investments. Uh, again, I mentioned all the different studios that set up. Or we can also grow, right, local studios, right, to be sizable, to have interesting projects. If I want to come back, right, uh, from overseas, right, there's two things, right? I, I mean, family is a given already, so that's already a strong factor there. But I think the next thing is my you know, security or, you know, I don't take too much of a pay cut, right? I think that's, that's the, other, the other thing. And with all these different companies right now, you, you, are, you have salaries at least in the senior positions that are close or matching, right, uh, to the international salaries. And the third thing is, there are also the projects, right? So I want to come back and I, I want to work on cool projects too. And I think right now we have that opportunity. We are exploring other things. I, I you know, we were looking, I think recently even uh, there's, um, you know, things like uh, returning Malaysians for, for, for income tax and so forth. These are some of the ideas that we are exploring uh, in order to bring back some of these talents. And that's actually really what's hampering us from moving to the next step, right? We've got, I think, content that's reached like the 70, 80% mark, but the last 20% requires opportunity. Yep. Right? Requires the capital, requires the expertise. Uh, we can try and, and we can pay a lot of tuition fees to get there. <laughs> So how can Malaysia encourage uh, its talented diaspora you know, to return and contribute to its digital creative industry? We facilitate uh, a lot of different studios to come into Malaysia. We facilitate uh, studios to grow. We give out grants to the studios. And so that, the, 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 that allows the studios to take risks right, on, on projects. We also provide quite a number of incentives for, for foreign studios right now to to send their work to Malaysia. I think we'll be launching something next year. I, I can't announce it yet. Yeah, there is an incentive. It's not very dissimilar to Fimi, but for the gaming side. Well, that's exciting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, there was a time when, when a few years back when I know, uh, Lucas opened up their offices in Singapore and there was a huge bunch of graphic designers and animators have moved to Singapore for mm -hmm. that very reason. And that was means uh, from from an our industry perspective, and think a lot of workforce just went there and were working with mm -hmm. because they were making working on Star Wars. <laughs> uh, but that shutting down, I mean, that was a big you know uh, jolt for all the animators and was as well as creatives who had gone from here. And yeah, did those creatives come back to Malaysia and work are, are working right now, or they have stayed back in Singapore, or what is the situation like? I, I think there's definitely a spillover back to Malaysia, right? Uh, again, I I've, I've mentioned again studios like you know PlayStation or, or or some of the bigger VFX studios, right? They are hiring, uh, they are giving out. There's a huge shortage, especially for uh, middle and senior talent. So any of these Malaysians, you know, they they would have ample opportunities here, right, to work on the next big PlayStation game or the next big EA game, right? Parts of, um, I guess, you know, EA's football game will eventually be built here as well, right? And again, like I said, you know, a studio like Larian Studios here, they, they just won. Uh, uh, game of the year for Baldur's Gate. That's, they're definitely going to expand as well, right? Uh, and with their recent success. <laughs> um, and there's actually so many more studios, right, that are opening up, uh, uh, especially on the gaming side of, of things. And the local animation studios are also expanding. They are growing, right? They are all, a lot of them are over 100 studios, right? 100 people right now, at least the bigger ones, are getting there. This movement of, uh, of talent, I think, is natural. And Malaysia is definitely a more logical place to do production than Singapore, given the cost of things. So obviously, when uh, certain incentives, I guess, that were you know put in Singapore, and those incentives are 
um, uh, I would say, you know, gone or, or changed, right? Um, those policies are changed. Um, uh, that focus, they usually come to Malaysia looking as, because uh, a lot of Malaysian talent is already working there anyway. Uh, in your experience, you know, how does integrating AI and virtual experiences impact the creativity and innovation in, in uh, content creation? You know, technology as an enhancer, not as a replacement, actually. Um, at least not yet in the, in the near future. In fact, uh, if, you, if you look at, let's say, things like YouTube as an example, right, you, you see a lot of content coming out all the time. But after a while, like right now, if I look at AI-generated art, I can kind of tell it's AI-generated art. You start seeing patterns and, and you get numb to that. So replacing creativity through generic templating is not, you know, it's like antithesis, right? You, yeah. And AI is definitely going to, or technology is definitely going to improve workflows, right? It, uh, but I think there are a lot of also, you know, ethical and regulatory, I would say, powers <laughs> that is going to kind of ensure that to some extent that the, that the content will be human finished as opposed to be completely machine created. But it's definitely an efficiency uh, approach. I used to be a game developer and, and uh, so I just did some pre-production work at the beginning, you know, some world building and, and stuff. And uh, what have taken me a team of say four or five, you know, uh, concept artists and, and and writers, right? You know, six months now, I can be, can be done, right, by myself in in two days, right? So just fire up ChatGPT, you know, get a get a stable diffusion or mid journey account out and run it, right? And I was quite impressed by the quality of the work because I did try doing iterations and it was pretty fast. So, and I, and I see that workflow uh, being already adopted, right, in so many places in many of the companies, right? Uh, in, definitely in terms of, of uh, developmental work, pre-production work, huge. Um, and then later on, uh, things like quality control, community management. AI is actually going to play a part in all of this already. And I already have some of our local studios that are already uh, exploring all of this. Do you believe that the increasing use of, you know, uh, technology in content creation uh, risks producing a generation of mechanical th thinkers? And uh, how do we balance tech with creativity? When you have generic content, it's... we. I, I, again, I want to use YouTube as an example, right? Uh, so there's so much content on YouTube today uh, or any of these social networks. And after a while, those, that, that content becomes generic and only the highest quality content uh, starts to stand out. And it's, it's the same thing. I think, uh, you know, relating back to the previous question, creativity needs to push boundaries, right? And technology is just there to help you push those boundaries. Again, I don't think it's a, it's a replacement for, for creativity. Again, most AI is based on, exists on historical data, right? It doesn't build anything new. I mean, creativity is the same thing. It's just putting multiple ideas together and coming up with something new. What we're going to be seeing, I think, is just uh, a more polarizing view on the good content that is going to be forced to, to become even more innovative and more creative. Uh, as more and more content come out, right, uh, you want to be pushing boundaries. I, again, I also think that technology will be able to provide new types of experiences. So right now, there's a, you know there's a there's an AI called Inworld. Uh, I think Microsoft has now partnered with them, uh, and this is about creating smart characters, right? So now you know historically, if you look at at a game or uh, or a scripted content, right? You have this linear branching series of scripts at at best. But here you have an opportunity to have a character, right, that is given a set of context, a set of rules, right, a set of uh, scopes and understandings and have a conversation, right, with this character within the boundaries of the narrative that you've created. So this opens up new kinds of experiences, right, I think that, you know, would not be traditionally available, yeah. right. You can have emerging, emerging storylines, right, coming out of these experiences. Uh, very exciting stuff. I think NVIDIA has its own version of it as well. 
So these are some of the things that we are exploring and also we are trying to build some partnerships with the right organizations to see how we can you know, bring, uh, bring these technologies right, and uh, you know, expose our, our com- companies to some of these things. That's good. That's, that's good to hear actually. Mm-hmm. So as a leader in gaming development, uh, you know, what is your perspective on Malaysia's position in the global gaming industry? I mean, based on statistic reports and so forth, I think market-wise, we are number 21, right? Number 21? 21 or 22, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, in terms of a market sizing, right? Um, again, after the top three or five, the numbers drop significantly. <laughs> um, we used to be slightly higher, I think, in the 18 rank, I think. Uh, but we're right now in the 20, uh, low 20s. In terms of production, from an outsourcing perspective, especially from an art perspective, we actually rank really, really high. Uh, Quite high, actually. Um, so there's a report done by this uh, group called XDS. XDS runs and uh, they run like a buyer's market, right, for external services. It's called External Developer Summit in, in Canada. And so they, they are a conglomerate of, or they are a group of all the big game companies and, and um, they produce a report every year. Uh, Malaysia has been ranked top three upcoming country for many, many years actually. Uh, I think for about three years, I think, in, in those reports. Um, we've also been ranked in the top 10 for in terms of external development uh, in the world actually uh, by this group. It's an important group. I think it's uh, pretty much the most influential uh, buying group in, in, uh, for the games development. We are definitely very strong uh, in some areas, but I think other areas we definitely could use help. Uh, so if you look at products or games that are Products that are most successful, that, that, uh, there are two types again, there are critical success and there's commercial success, right? Uh, usually, products that have huge commercial success have something called, we call a life service uh, component to it. And, and that's something that we are missing at the moment. So if you look at all the esports games or the big online games, they all have a life service component. Uh, and so from a visual perspective, we are really, really strong. From a narrative perspective, we are not bad. We are, I think there's, we have improvements there. But then from a technical and, and again, from a, from a mostly a technical and life operations perspective, that's one of those areas that we, we want to grow and improve. And so from, from our angle, you know, that's one of the things when we look at and evaluate the companies that are coming into Malaysia, uh, are they going to bring a, a life service operation kind of product into the country? That's currently one of the priorities that I'm, I'm looking at. So if they fit those criteria, we're happy to... <laughs> to facilitate their you know, domiciling to Malaysia. How does MDEX support the growth of esports and gaming streamers in Malaysia? Esports, I think, can be broken up. Esports basically mirrors, it's again, it's a subset of the games, of the games industry, right? Um, and, it, and esports actually behaves very, a lot similarly to a traditional sports industry. The only difference here is that uh, instead of a public game, right? This game actually belongs to a company, whether it's a developer or publisher. Um, and so a lot of the game's continuity, right, is very, very dependent, right, on what the game company uh, plans to do with that product. It's a huge, huge, it's, it's a growing and massive industry, uh, especially with the youth right now. Uh, it's, it's part of their daily, it's part of their lives. So when you look at esports, it's kind of broken into two parts. There's, there's the talent development or the athlete development or the people development. And then there's what I call industry development. Um, so MDEC focuses more on the industry development side of things. So we look at you know, facilitating the game companies, the publishers to come here to, to run events, to uh, facilitate them to, to bring their, their publishing operations here. So then they, you can create being closer to the con- the creator themselves provides more opportunities. And that's where MDAC stance is. We also look at local companies to see how they can, if they have an esports game, uh, how we can help promote those games. So games like, uh, there was a game called Eximus, uh, and then more recently a game like Gigabash, uh, which is kind of like a Smash Bros. But from Mario, uh, from Nintendo. It's a similar kind of game, right? Uh, but this is using big kaijus, you know. You have, a, I think they have a tie-in with Ultraman and Godzilla and, and a few already. They won quite a number of awards in, I think, best indie game in Tokyo Game Show in 2019, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, <clears throat> 2018, yeah. 
And then, uh, so there's a lot. And, and so what we do is we, we help get people to, re, to play this game and, and, and expand this. Uh, as well as for athlete development, we work closely with uh, uh, KBS, right? So they, they are agencies and they are organizations under them are uh, more responsible right, for the actual development of our national athletes in, this, in these games. With the vision of transforming Southeast Asia uh, into a dynamic digital content hub, what specific initiatives is MDEC uh, implementing to address the identified gaps uh, in script writing, storytelling and promotion? For talent gaps, I think, you know, we, we are working with schools, we run a lot of different uh, small programs, I say, like, you know, competitions and so forth. Um, we had a, a scripting pitch that was done in our creative event recently. So we're exploring, really want to increase the, the script writing capabilities. Our, our ability to produce the actual technical animation itself has, is uh, quite, re quite established. Uh, but I, I do recognize that, you know, things like our writing and cross both, or see, most mediums actually, both the animation and games, right? Uh, is something that we can improve on. So again, we do a lot of workshops. We, we bring in the right, we bring in mentors and so forth, and uh, to be able to coach, right? Uh, especially the the newer studios, uh, animation or games, uh, and that's one of the things that we do. How are we fixing these gaps? You know, where script writing and storytelling and Promotion is concerned. Promotion, yeah, yeah. So in terms of promoting, we bring all the companies out to many, many markets, right? So animation, um, we were supposed to be in ATF, <laughs> but we couldn't make it this year. But we go to, generally we go to MIP, MIPCOM, uh, MIP Junior. Uh, NSC is probably our biggest animation event uh, that we attend. Uh, Kids Screen in the US. Uh, so we do promote our local IPs in, in these events. Uh, in fact, recently we actually did an uh, animation festival together with GSE and we highlighted some of the local animations. And I think it was uh, pretty eye-opening for a lot of people that actually watched to see the, the quality of the animations that, that, uh, that we have. As for the game side of things, uh, you know, we run events like my DCF or Level Up, uh, really to get the audience to be aware that these are actually Malaysian-made games. Right. Uh, in fact, most of the time when people see things like Gigabash, they don't believe that this is a Malaysian made game. Yeah. yeah. To look at it, we actually have four pillars that uh, we do within MDAC itself. Uh, the first pillar is talent development. The second pillar is uh, in terms of uh, company growth, actually. So we want to help companies uh, scale and grow. Uh, by providing them the you know access to funding, access to to know how and networking, the third part is about you know growing uh, IPs actually. So it's where we give out grants and de-risk companies right from and to to be experimental to try uh, new things. Um, and then the last part is really focusing on on promotions actually. So that's again that's where we take people we take companies to studios to markets and as well as really trying to to we run a lot of you know. Uh, on-ground roadshows as well uh, through our Sire Digital campaigns, uh, MDEX bigger Sire Digital campaigns, uh, and also obviously our Malaysia Digital Content Festival. Considering the significant role of India uh, in the gaming sector, how does MDEC envision fostering cross-cultural collaborations and co-productions to benefit both Malaysia and Southeast Asian countries uh, for digital content uh, for Means how how both can you know help each other? I think low hanging fruit really is just promotions on both sides, right? Um, just getting exposure to Malaysian content in India and, and and vice versa. If you're looking specifically at the games industry, I think India didn't have a games industry prior to five to six years ago, but then uh, it's grown rapidly right, in the last five to six years. I actually had a friend here, he's um, and he set up a fund called Lumikai in India. And I think that's one of the one of the big uh, uh, impetuses. I think one point you had a market, but you just needed you needed capital and the right funding, right, to 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 kickstart it. And of course, I, I think again, right now the the audiences have expanded their their reach, or rather their access. Generally, access has gotten better for them. I think 
one is promotions. I think the other thing that we can explore, uh, uh, I mean, for animation, usually it's similar to any other co-production in film. So, so we need to have a treaty in place before we can benefit from all those. So I think it's really about riding on, on Finas is such the, the body that is leading these uh, initiatives. But other than that, you know, uh, we've seen some transfer of talents, uh, not so much with India, but I think recently uh, we've had one with with um, with the Saudis. Uh, so there's a there's a big group there called uh, uh, the Savi Group, which is actually it's a government-funded entity to drive the games industry in uh, in in from Saudi, and within there they have a couple of pillars. So I'm actually taking a page out of some of the things that they're doing. Obviously, the scale that they're doing it is is in a different level. Yeah, right? they're quite bullish in that in that zone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I I, I think they are funded by PIF, which is basically their sovereign fund, and uh, you know they've been buying up companies a lot, right? I think the most recent large acquisition was a company called Scopely that does Monopoly Go on your phone, right? And they bought that company for six billion. Wow. Yeah, so the size of that fund itself is massive, right? <laughs> so where we were collaborating with one of their divisions called 966, so 966 is really about building the Thailand, it's uh, pool in Saudi, was that they sent like uh, some of their uh, people to come to our studios in Malaysia to learn from our studios here. Because what they do have is capital, but they, they lack some experience. And we have a longer you know, exposure to, 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 to projects and experiences here. On a side note, you've been a game developer and you obviously are completely immersed in all the gaming consoles and games. What's your favorite game? I, I think that's a, it's a really tough question to answer and, and it's changed all the time, right? And in fact, these days I have very little time to play games, <laughs> ironically. Um, so I'm right now I'm playing this game called uh, Marvel Snap because it's it's kind of a, a online mobile card game, uh, and that I can finish within two minutes or three minutes. Yeah, so that's just because of time. But I I've recently been playing uh, Baldur's Gate as well. I mean, uh, one fun I guess a small fact is that uh, <laughs> I landed up in the game for some reason. <laughs> uh, it's a story on its own actually. <laughs> And so the, the founder, the creator said, you have to go find yourself in the game. And so I was motivated to play the game for that. Among other reasons, it's a great game, yeah. Uh, as investment and support grow in the region, uh, what measures is MDEC taking to ensure that Southeast Asia uh, is the emerging content market and which remains competitive and innovative globally? When I, when I first looked at at Southeast Asia, and, and when I joined MDAC initially, I was like, what do we have going for us? Uh, that's the question I asked myself, actually. Um, if you look at Indonesia, they have a huge population. If you look at uh, Singapore, they have, they just have much better finances, right? Uh, in terms of, uh, and then you look at the other countries, at least the ones that I thought that were ahead of us, right? Um, uh, even Thailand and, and, and Vietnam, for instance, they have closed markets, which leads to advantages because of a captured audience, right? So for us, it was really about being the coolest place, I felt. Uh, that was the strategy that we employed, uh, I decided. Um, what can we do to be the coolest place, right, in Southeast Asia for whatever there is, games or animation? Creating level up and creative, right, uh, and making it as a tenpole activities, right, became one of the things. Because it was to highlight, right, and show, bring every... In fact, we, what we did was we brought, like, all the different, the best that we had in Southeast Asia. And we put it into KL for that one week, right? And so for the rest of the world, right, KL seemed right, like this really cool place with all these different uh, studios from all of the place. So I guess, you know, <laughs> putting a good party is, is, uh, is... It goes a long way. Yeah, it goes a long way. Every time like an international studio comes here, yeah, we would take them to enjoy local delicacies and, and meet the locals, right? It was really just highlighting the good things that we already have in Malaysia, actually. Because, like I said, we, we are not going to be able to beat in terms of market size with Indonesia or, or you know, the financial hub that Singapore is. Or even the Thais, for instance, like I said, you know, because when you want to compete, our, we are open, we are open market, right? And so, um, again, fun fact, uh, 
some of our restaurants and food are actually in some games. It's just that people don't know it only. So one of the examples is the you know, the Last of Us is that there's this big uh, there's this uh, crab shop in the game that's actually inspired by one of the local because one of the art directors. Uh, he came here and enjoyed the food here so much, and then in Las Vegas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think it's a big man crab. I think. Yeah, yeah. But, but they didn't put it in the TV show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and again, you've got again some of our local uh, guys have put in things like sate and te tare into games like Final Fantasy and so forth. It's really about uh, providing um, and showcasing what what Malaysians. Actually, we do have strong talents already. We just need better experience, uh, and uh, also I think we need just better access outside of government funding. Uh, so one of the things we are really working hard this, at the moment is seeing how we can unlock, you know, private funding uh, to into the space. What are the, some of the most exciting trends you foresee in the digital creative content industry over the next few years? I see a merging between entertainment, social, uh, and even real life connections, right? The, the lines are getting blurred. The lines are getting blurred, right? In fact, if you just look at this specific industries right now, if you look at uh, animation in games, right? The line is becoming extremely blurred, right? Unreal Engine is starting to power both the games and the animation workflows already. And so you're going to need the same talent pools you're going to need, right? Uh, in fact, for virtual production in films as well, it's, it's you're seeing this bleed, right? So all these are going to converge. So that's one, there's this big convergence happening in terms of technologies, in terms of, um, in terms of the way we consume content and, 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 uh, and live as well. So putting it further down the road, and I know I brought up this thing called the metaverse in the past again. And, and I talked about this IP360 project that we are working on. So the, the IP360 project, you know, historically, Malaysia, uh, MDEC has been supporting this industry for easily 15 years, especially the animation, right? Uh, I think games more in the last seven to eight years or so. We've actually, you know, uh, supported like almost every major IP uh, in the animation game space. And so the idea here is that we want to we wanna create this, uh, you know, this IP universe first. Uh, and because if you look at the animation IPs, you know, uh, the successful ones, they have over, you know, tens of millions of followers already. And they have extremely high engagements with the population already. And the idea is to bring all these IPs in so that we can also highlight the lesser known IPs, you know. Uh, so we talked about upcoming IPs like, you know, Kesa Bautana and so forth. Uh, and we want to highlight these, these IPs to the rest. The question is that now you can engage with these IPs, but what kind of experiences can you create out of it, right? Uh, you, you can now do, you know, sing along songs, for instance, with Didi and Friends in the game, right? In this metaverse, you can, you know, just have a chill out storytelling session with, uh, you know, Agent Ali, for instance. So these are things that we want to start exploring um, uh, as, as how, you know, again, concerts have become uh, digital already. The metaverse, the IP360 project is about is about building this IP universe, right? Uh, really highlighting all of, all our different content in a way that is new and is fresh. Uh, so something that is, uh, I think we have a new opportunity. Again, once you have, I'm jumping the gun here, but once you have traffic, right, then you can think about other other aspects. I'm not talking just about commercial aspects, but you can you, once you have traffic, you can do a lot of things with it. And so the IPs are a way of of attracting and creating uh, this engagement right with the audiences first. Of course, powering all of this, you know, you're gonna have AI and things like blockchain when when it comes to to things like new ownership and so forth. Uh, but I think it's that's still very experimental for now. This is a good point you made, actually. So in your opinion, what are the key elements needed to build a successful digital content hub in Malaysia? I think the key ingredients, uh, num number one, is, is providing opportunity. It's providing opportunity. And it starts off, I think, is opportunity for, for like, the talent to come back, opportunities for new companies to be here, opportunities for projects to be here opportunities for, for companies here to, to grow and expand to, to 
uh, and scale actually. Uh, again, I mentioned, I touched back to our four pillars. Um, so we have a, we've been working on a, a, a blueprint slash policy for the digital content space. Hopefully we can launch it next year. <laughs> uh, uh, and at least it, it rolls, it, it looks at, you know, uh, what we want to do in the next seven years. Fundamentally, therefore, again, I, I, so there's these four pillars, right? And it's, it comes down to talent development. It comes down to um, how do you help to scale companies? And a lot of it has to do with funding. Funding and capacity growth. So people, money, um, and I think experience. One important thing I think is We've definitely, I think we are definitely right now kind of like an early teenager in, uh, in the industry uh, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, but crossing into this mature state, what we are lacking right now is experience actually. Uh, so one of the things I really hope that we can do is find ways to increase the accessibility, right? For experienced talent to come uh, and and work in Malaysia actually. So whether it's through specialized visas or specialist incentives, it's one of those things that we're looking at. Because I think capital, once you have the right talent in place, capital will follow. We have already branded ourselves internationally to some degree, at least from both the animation and game side. If you go to an, you know, it's kind of cool when I went to like kids screen earlier in the year, people came by, oh, it's Malaysia, right? So we are not, we're not unknown. Yeah, yeah people recognize us already. Right. And we won multi. We won uh, best game two years in a row, uh, or what do you call it? in this event called GDC, which is Game Developers Conference. Right, that's like thirty to forty thousand developers coming in there, and a Malaysian game won uh, two Malaysian games won two back to back years in a row. Right, so it it kind of tells that we are getting somewhere, uh, but we are, we are at the cusp, right, of, of this greatness. And uh, I, I think we will be getting there in the next, you know. God, God willingly, we will be there very, very soon. So what advice would you have for the young talents who are aspiring to enter the digital creative content industry in Malaysia? Right now, I think there's, there's, an, there's a lot of different opportunities. Uh, um, there's just so much... Um, so much opportunity, to be honest. There's so many companies that are set up here. Uh, all looking to hire, right? I, if I were to look back 10 to 15 years ago, when I first, you know, had a game developers, there was this game developers association, right? And there were four people sitting at a mama table, right? And then about five to six, about seven years or eight years ago, just before I joined MDEC, right? Uh, we had about 30 people, right, hanging out at Starbucks and we had four drinks, right? So at that point in time, I felt, I think, you know, we needed a better location and uh, <laughs> to host these events. And, but today, if you go to one, or we call any of these game gatherings, right, you see 150, 200 people easily in those events, right? And, and it's filled to the brim. My, my advice really is, what I'm saying is that, you have a you have a strong community. You have a you have a lot of support from the government. Make use of all of this that this these opportunities that are provided to you. I think this is a, it's a great time to be you know in the creative industry, digital content industry, whether you're an animation company uh, or games company. Yeah, go explore, try. It's a really exciting time to be in this space. Finally, in your view, who is the fiercest cyberspace? The keyboard warrior. Or the console warrior? I think they're both scary, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I think the keyboard, just because they're able to type more stuff <laughs> faster than the console guys. <laughs> Using a controller isn't the easiest thing to, to type stuff. Um, but I, I, I've been a PC gamer for the longest period of time. So I would like to say PC gamers. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, OK. Thank you so much, Mr. Mohan, for coming and, and having this great uh, chat with us and also sharing your experience. Uh, I think people who will be listening and watching this uh, will gain a lot of insight into, the, into what MDEC is doing at this point of time and how the next generation of uh, gamers and uh, game developers as well as animators uh, have in store for the Malaysian content industry. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
The digital creative content industry is not just about technology. It's about the people, the creativity, and the stories we tell. It's about nurturing a new generation of thinkers who can blend the best of technology with the richness of human creativity. As for the battle between the keyboard warriors and console warriors, is the digital arena as diverse and dynamic as the talents that populate it? This has been What's Doing and I'm Abid. Hoping today's conversation has inspired you as much as it did me. Until next time, keep pushing the boundaries of your creativity and keep stewing. Mm-hmm.